Thank you Coding Dojo for sponsoring today's video. Love imports. No, this doesn't fit. Uh, uh, nice. Uh, uh. Oh, massage seats. get used to hello yeah yeah no my bad yeah I'm coming most of us including myself probably don't realize how impressive this is imagine bringing your entire workflow for $600 anywhere you go this year, ladies and gentlemen, is what I like to call the level entry Apple ecosystem machine, a computer that just recently replaced my MacBook Pro at home. And that's mainly because I've been diving super deep into proper iOS development and just doing admin work from my house. And to be honest, since I've been barely working on DaVinci at the condo, I decided to keep this at the home office and treat this as my programming and general use machine. Now, on my end, I think there's like no point on using the M2 Air. So about a couple of weeks ago, I had gone to the mall to buy a new unit. Actually, the day we got the M2 Pro where we had filmed our day in the life video. I would have loved to unbox this within that same day, but filming the M2 Pro video was already enough. Now, we got the base model M2 Mac Mini here, and from the M1 Mac Mini, the unboxing experience hasn't really changed all that much. After ripping the plastic lids off the box, when you first unbox this, the first thing you will find is the Mini itself. My unit was strangely dirty, but it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, after you sort of get rid of all those black plastic stickers covering the bottom and the IOs on this chassis, you will find how beautiful this thing looks. The rest of the box is your standard Apple packaging experience. You get the guides along with some silver stickers, love the matching stickers and the power cord. So honestly, all this is just the Mac mini and its power cord easy to transport and easy to bring wherever you go. In my case, the office. Now, hardware wise, the base model has been fantastic. I mean, remember that all this can be bought for as lowest as $500 on an educational discount. $500 that pretty much gets you the latest M2 chip with an eight core CPU, a 10 core GPU, eight gigabytes of RAM paired with a 256 gigabyte of storage. And for a lot of people, I know that this doesn't really say all that much. Just know that this M2 chip is responsible for delivering two Thunderbolt 4 ports so you can enjoy faster transfer speeds, high pixel density monitors up to 6K and mediocre refresh rate at around 60 Hertz or so. You guys saw that drop down, right? Like that's been a thing I've been trying to figure out for the past like two weeks. Why do we get 96 Hertz and now, let me show you, look at this. Now, I get one, 144 and variable 144, and I know that works for a fact because if I type test UFO right here, I get 144. Aren't we like not supposed to be getting 144 Hertz with the M2? I thought it was only M2 Pro, I'm confused. Just can someone please explain? Of course, if you end up pairing one of those ports with the HDMI 2.0 port, you can rock up to two monitors within your setup. M2 is also responsible for handling an Ethernet port, a 3.5mm headphone jack, and a couple of USB -A ports. But you know what's really impressive from a general standpoint of view is that I can use a single Thunderbolt cable to connect my dock that pairs with a little USB A controller and very much connect everything. This includes my gigabyte monitor, my whole audio setup with my audio interface that controls my headphones, microphone, and my KRK speakers. My peripherals, which also include my mouse, my keyboard, and my webcam. And so all of this leaves the other ports free to use just because a single Thunderbolt 4 cable can easily handle all these things at once. Don't get me wrong, if you are someone that prefers rocking wireless peripherals with Bluetooth 5.3, it will definitely save you 
a ton of headaches. In other words, 5.3 is the latest Bluetooth version that also focuses on minimizing interferences, meaning that connecting your wireless keyboard of choice with a wireless mouse you enjoy and headphones like the AirPods Max should now deliver a better wireless experience and avoid your mouse signal from dropping or your keyboard from going crazy while you're typing. It's something I've tested, however, I gotta say that Wi-Fi 6E is not something I've been able to try. You see, most people at home don't even have Wi-Fi 6E routers and sometimes providers use their own routers and modems to deliver internet at home. So as cool as this is, it's not something that the general public will benefit from as of right now. But one thing you guys will for sure benefit from is that you know those two prong power cords that PlayStation 5s have? These are actually pretty standard on a lot of power banks and stuff. Anyways, these are actually compatible with the Mac Mini, and if you are someone like me that enjoys having clean cable management, and you like to bring this from maybe one office to the other, just get yourself a second cord, no need to untangle the original one out of your setup. And so, apart from being able to handle all these IOs, M2 is actually being cooled down by a fan. So unlike the M2 chip that's in my MacBook Air, this is very much like the MacBook Pro in the way that it has a proper thermal system. However, when I first opened this, like many other techies, we've realized that the storage module on this is being managed by a single NAND chip. And to save you some time and research, nobody cares. You're not going to realize this because this is a machine that's meant to invite you to Apple's ecosystem and enjoy general use tasks as well as some web development and level entry mobile development. Look, to demonstrate this, let me first explain what reading and writing speeds actually mean. On an SSD, reading speeds means how fast can a machine access files stored on it. Examples of that can be booting times, opening a file for the first time, which can take a bit of time depending on your speeds, maybe letting your emulator launch your app and whatnot. Writing speeds on the other hand can be things like saving a file from Photoshop or maybe even copying a file from one location to the other. Both combined create an important factor to consider when talking about storage. But why do I tell people of this use caliber to not care? Well, as someone that's been spending time coding and using this as a general use machine, I haven't noticed this machine slowing down my workflow at all. A simple example to showcase copying speeds would be cloning projects from GitHub into local storage. And so I imported a pretty big coding project onto my M2 Mac mini and my M1 Pro MacBook at the same time. And the difference when it comes to the time it takes when writing to memory is really not that big. Look, there's no better way of showing overall speeds and performance than by showing you a little demo of how much I can push this machine. And so I don't wanna bore you guys, but I really wanna show you how great this machine has been for general use. Now, right here on the left, I'm on Chrome. I have a bunch of tabs open and I'm currently working on learning Excel. Let's say I am on an Excel file and also I have a bunch of other files right here open, but we're working on this one. She's just talking about pivot tables and I wanna know how I can convert this into a real table. So I go here and then convert this. Yes, I can even go and traverse it like this, which is pretty good store i can let's say unselect everything and click on micro world it's going to take a bit of time there you go and we got it now we have all the micro world stores pretty cool can go up and down and that's how it behaves i can of course go and pause this video or play this video back again and she's talking about how i can just go on table design which is different from windows so Remember Mac OS and Excel on Windows OS is it's different, but I can name it here, data table, boom, it's all named, pretty cool. Um, let's say I wanna open Spotify because I am bored. Open Spotify, I wanna listen to some music and there you go, that's pretty much loaded. I can open Discord because I am a friendly person and I like talking to my friends. And I can also open up a Notion because all my work processes are there and that's how I work. So Notion opens pretty freaking quick. And also because I am a developer, I like opening Visual Studio. And because I like pictures, I am going to be opening Lightroom. Now it seems like I know how to do everything, which I don't really, I just half-ass everything, but pretty cool. Now I am on Lightroom, nice. Oh wow, okay, I can maybe go ahead and just tweak these pictures like this. And there you see, now I'm starting to demand quite a lot from this machine. Not everything's very responsive, but note that I have a lot of things open. I can even go, oh, acting up. Oh, 
acting up again. Now I'm demanding quite a lot, okay? So uh, let's say I wanna open this on Photoshop. Uh, there you go, starting to lag. And this is where I'm asking too much from it. But how many people are gonna be doing all of this at once? Not that many. And so general use has been fantastic, but like I said, as soon as you start going overboard with this, you'll notice things slowing down. From using Chrome to Excel and other softwares like Spotify, Word, Discord, and even Notion, it's been great. However, as shown, where this machine does lack is when you really start asking for more. Like aside from having a bunch of Chrome tabs open, some Excel spreadsheets with a podcast running in the background, as soon as you decide to do some photo or video editing on a software like Lightroom and Premiere, things start to bug. You're better off using something like Final Cut for entry level editing, but just know that if editing starts to somewhat be a priority, the moment you upgrade cameras and you start working with heavy codecs, you will very much start noticing this machine slowing down. And this is where I deviate from recommending the base model and maybe taking a look at their M2 Pro lineup. Although for programming, this thing has been surprisingly great. And not because I'm amazed at the fact this can do things like web development, but more because it's been able to handle my iOS development journey like a charm. However, if you are someone that wants this machine and would like to use it to learn web development, one of the best ways of doing so is through a bootcamp. Bootcamps can save you money, time, and some headaches, and Coding Dojo is actually there to help you start a new career in tech in a matter of weeks. A few months ago, I attended their online coding bootcamp where they gave me a schedule for the day to follow. We did some algorithm exercises which reminded me very much of my time in uni, except that this time, things were so much more interactive and people seemed to be a lot more interested. The instructor made a few group activities that were organized within our Zoom call. We used Replit to make sure we were able to collaborate on code and I have to give it to her. She was extremely good at explaining topics and explaining the principles of algorithms. Coding Dojo is also part of Colorado's Technical University. They overall have a well-rounded curriculum where you will learn Python, JavaScript, Java, .NET, and much more. You'll have access to a bunch of resources teachers, interactive activities, and an online platform, all depending on what type of program you pick, of course. Whether you decide to go into software development, data science, or cybersecurity, for you new Mac Mini users that wanted to get a machine like this to get into development, I invite you to check their coding bootcamps in the description down below. And I also invite you guys to get a machine like this for your development needs. However, not all of them. You see, for the past few weeks, I've been learning how to jump back into proper iOS development. And when I say proper, Proper, I'm not talking about UI work. I'm talking about learning MVVM, learning Swift concepts that I never really took seriously before, slowly diving into declarative programming, and even making proper API calls. And recently, since I went from the M2 Air to the new M2 Mini, I've honestly been as happy with it. I've always told people, avoid getting into mobile development with a MacBook Air. And while I still stand behind that thought, I do think that level entry mobile development uniquely in Xcode is so doable with an M2 chip. Not Flutter nor React Native, avoid those cause Android emulators eat your resources and when you pair that with an iOS emulator, your 8GB of RAM suddenly becomes a waste. But my own current development workflow has been very different. I usually have Xcode open with iTerm2, Spotify, Postman to interact with APIs, and a bunch of tabs open on Brave or Chrome to help out with my development needs. And I'm happy to say that things run like super well. Do know that while I haven't been doing graphic intensive UIs at all, I've been able to type code extremely fast, build my project with ease, IntelliSense being reliable, and deploy to the emulator with no issues. In fact, if I was to compare this to my M1 Pro MacBook, I feel like I'm just at home but that's because I've been using this as the type of user that's getting into mobile development. Let me show you guys something super fascinating as well. I wanted to measure the compilation time in Xcode across my three machines by using a large code base from Def Me Romanco on GitHub, and I noticed a few things. First of all, M1 Pro is not that much faster than the M2 chip, especially not for people that 
want to learn. And second, temperatures on the M2 Mini are so much better compared to the laptops. I feel like the M2 Air is being slowed down in compile times because it's fanless, which is why I also downloaded the WebKit benchmark so I could push this above and beyond their capabilities, making me realize that having a fan on the M2 Mini will avoid thermal throttling and will ensure that you take advantage of the power as much as you can. While my benchmark was running, I of course checked my CPU power output being drawn by the laptop and I tried getting it on the M2 Mini. However, Ventura currently doesn't support AC top. The WebKit test was sort of of an incomplete test and oddly enough, times varied quite a lot between the M2 Mini and the M2 Air. Then in terms of RAM usage within the activity monitor, they both seem to be performing sort of the same, but the issue with this test is that it doesn't show the full picture because I don't have full control of how much RAM is being allocated for this test. And so what I wanted to do is to find a way to fill the RAM even more so the machine could intensively swap memory with their NAND chips in order to accommodate for resources. I really wanted to see if these slower NAND chip speeds affect the computer at all. Well, I found a GitHub stress test injector that allowed me to inject the amount of memory usage I wanted and observe how that usage is being dealt with while it's all happening. 24 gigabytes of RAM being injected. And I just wanna see how this starts to behave. I'm opening Brave. We see it's swap used, it's going up. Brave is taking a bit of time to open. Six gigabytes, seven gigabytes. It's opening a bunch of these tabs I had open before. Nine gigabytes, it's not too bad up to now. Oh yeah, okay, there you go. It's starting to go off. So I wanna go on GitHub. Yeah, now it's starting to lag a bit. If I try to launch pad, okay. And it's going dead on me. 76, 15 gigabytes being swapped. I really want to see how this compared to the, oh, this go off. Not enough disk space because obviously now I'm swapping more and more with the disk. Stack overflow, I can't even type anymore. It's not typing. Okay, now I want to see what happens on the MacBook Air. I genuinely just want to see if there's like a difference, if I feel a difference in speed, you know, because I'm, I'm very much loading this up with a bunch of RAM. Let's see, Brave Browser. Six gigabytes, eight gigabytes being swapped. It's gonna keep going up. I feel like it's slower than the Mac Mini. They both have one NAND chip, so be mindful of that. I'll try it on on the M1 Pro after. 12 gigabytes, come on, Brave. You can do it. Wow, okay, that's slow. This is not even working. Launch pad, okay, there you go, froze. That's crazy, because even though this this compiles faster on, on WebKit, it's, it feels slower. Okay, web, okay, there you go. Command spacebar works. Let's say I want to open Chrome instead. Okay, Chrome works. Let's say I go on GitHub. How much am I at? 20 gigabytes being swapped. It's taking so long to, to load. Brave hasn't opened yet. Can I open Discord? Oh my God. Okay, there you go. This is dead. Okay, on this one, there's two NAND chips. I'm running 48 gigabytes of RAM, triple, just like the other ones. The other ones were 24, but I have 16 gigabytes here. So let's run this, stress testing 48 gigabytes of RAM. And I wanna see if you genuinely feel a difference. Obviously my activity monitor, I gotta watch out for that. See how many, let's keep it there. Okay, let's start already. RAM swap, ignore. Okay, let's see if I can load. Maybe let's start to load a YouTube video because this is able to give us a bit more. 21 gigabytes of being swapped with okay you can tell it's already it's it's a lot quicker it's a lot faster let me just mute this stuff here yeah 33 gigabytes being swapped look at that this is what two nan chips i guess delivers look i have no issues okay that's pretty impressive that's pretty good and of course you guys might be wondering what about web development guys Web development really isn't that demanding. Like on the M2 Air, most code bases that involve JavaScript with React, Angular, Node.js, and so on will excel on this machine. And so Speedometer will show you that across different variations of MacBooks and Macs, all these machines can easily handle web development with no issues. I'm talking about developers that want to be pro-efficient at mobile development, game development, using AI, some Web3 stuff, these are the types of devs that will find that the M2 base model machines lack in power and resources, which is why the M2 Pro option can be interesting for a lot of people, especially since it's a machine that offers double the USB-C ports, HDMI 2.1 allowing you to feed more monitors, double the RAM and storage, all of that for $1,400, which is not too bad. It's basically like a base model MacBook Pro, but cheaper. Of course, I'm not including the 120 Hertz monitor here, the peripherals, the portability, and so on. But if those are things you've already got or working on the move is not something you need, 
I can't recommend any other machine than this Mac Mini spec'd out. It's absolutely wild what we now get in a Mini. Look, on my end, I'm going to be rocking this for a bit. I'm going to be putting the M2 Air aside for now, especially since I need to start using the M2 Pros and see how these like evolve over time. From the comments we get, it really seems like these videos truly help you guys out. I'm super happy they do because they take a lot of time to make and plan. My job is to review, to use, and to test, and it's why I love doing this as a job. I hope this has been a useful review to you. It's always a pleasure, guys. I'm signing out. Take care. Thank you.